there is a connection between people being in poverty and, and being desperate enough to commit crimes. I'm not going to deny that connection. I think there is a connection there. But the idea that if you got rid of police, you would cut down, especially on violent crime, is just ridiculous. There's no proof to show that. And even more than that, Chris, we talked about this before. I think it really shows a naivete about human nature and why people sin and why people hurt each other. I'm kind of getting sick of people blaming all crime on poor people. Most poor people do not commit violent crime. Most poor people are not criminals. And so before we even know who committed some, we're automatically saying, blaming it on poor people. No, some people commit crimes because that's what they've chosen to do with their free will. Or maybe they do have other issues going on. But we can't just simply say, hey, don't fund anything for the police. Let them go untrained or let them not be there at, at all. And things are going to just get better if you invest it in other places. Your eyes on the times, you walk ready to speak up. But with so many problems, you're exhausted trying to keep up. This is the Church Politics Podcast, where you can get political commentary from a biblical worldview. We're not trying to be conservative or progressive. We're trying to be Christian in the public square. And I'm black as heaven. I'm made in God's image. Nobody can change my settings. Amen. Hey man, cut off my knees and put an end to my search. It's easy to sell your soul when you don't know what it's worth. With your no good, Ann Camp, you're listening to the Ann Campaign's Church Politics Podcast with Justin Gibney, a.k.a. Bishop Cooper's grandson, and the Windy City representative, the baddest brother above the Mason-Dixon line, my play cousin, the right reverend, Christopher Butler. Chris, how are you doing, and uh, what, what's new in your space, brother? Um, I'm doing really well. Uh, the, um, the rest of my space, I'm gonna mention that maybe like two episodes from now was really new. Uh, but other than that, two episodes from now, now, now I'm intrigued. Y'all got to come back and, and hear what's happening. Two episodes <laughs> from today. One, Why? One, one or two. One or two. We'll see. One or two. Okay. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Fair enough. So, uh, we got some news coming from you. You know, one of the things that's been great for me and, and just really made, you know, uh, my day brighter and just beautiful was summer comes and there's no more Lakers yeah. and we don't even have to talk about that no more. I mean, there's no dark cloud hanging over the NBA and wondering who's the goat. Now we know the goat is MJ for anybody that had any questions. Will this team who didn't really do any, anything during the regular season gets lucky in one or two series in the, in the playoffs. And now they're gone and we can just focus on, Yes, Denver had a setback this last game, but we can focus on Denver winning this championship and moving forward. And so for me, that's what's new. That's what's bright in my world. And I think it, it makes, you know, it makes our country in general a brighter place because we don't have people, um, you know, just pushing these falsehoods about fake goats and all this other stuff, man. So that's hey, what's been good for me. I don't know. We, we might, though, be looking at the um, the secret son of the real goat, Uh run around out there with the uh with the Miami Heat so you know we will say that again we'll have to see we'll did you to mean see. to say goat or did you mean to say something else no as I mean, a person as a person from Chicago I'm not even from Chicago as a person from Chicago the only goat no I said the secret song do you know was the, people, people are, no are saying saying if, if uh, Jimmy Butler is Michael Jordan's secret son no I'm I'm gonna we'll put see. the end to that right now no, we're gonna have to go right. on the uh, Mars one go, but look. But here's Chris. Let me release everybody from all this. We can talk about good players. Like everything, don't have to be about who's the goat. No, no, no. This Let's guy, nowhere close to the player. goat. No, we're not putting him in that conversation. Let's not even talk about. It. Let's not even bring the name goat up. Let's we're say, just, hey, is Jimmy Butler the son of somebody good, or well, somebody really good, or somebody Hall of Fame, but not the goat? All right, I just want to keep the goat out of some of these conversations because I, I just think the name is used. You know, we we throw it out there too easily, man. That's that's all I got to say about that, man. Well, we'll see. we'll see. I'm gonna watch. I'm gonna watch Jimmy. See if, if MJ shows up at a game, uh, sit sit in the back rows. Then we then we'll we know. I, I don't I don't see him. the relation. I don't see the similarity. But hey, Jimmy Butler think, can play ball. You don't think they look alike? No, I don't see the similarity in the game. But I, 
I can see some some uh, paternal questions. I have to look again, but I, I I didn't see it originally. Well, I want I want to remind everybody that you need to check out our Invisible Institution newsletter. Um, uh, we had one that came out last month. The June one is uh, the June edition is on its way, so you want to check that out. But also go to our to our website to see the How I Got Over docu series, which is about the role that the authority of Scripture played in the black church and its music in the establishment of the black church and even in its social action. It's a, uh, we have four, it's a five part documentary, but three parts are up right now. And there's another one coming within the next week or so. So y'all be on the lookout for that. If you haven't checked out that documentary, you tripping, you need to go check it out. Also go to Instagram or YouTube and check out our new whole life project video. A lot of people like that video. You need to check it out. It's different. We are changing or correcting the narrative when it comes to abortion. So check that out, man. We got to think through this and not just listen to talking points. Well, as always, I want to say, uh, uh, give a shout out to our sponsor, which is the Fester Institute for supporting us in what we do and how we do it. And also give a shout out to all those people that uh, are our patrons uh, on patreon.com slash church politics. Look, this content takes time to put together. We put a lot of work into it, do a lot of research, put a lot of thought into it. It is not easy. Uh, Chris, you know, he got a lot going on, has other things he could be doing. Please support us because when you support this podcast, you're supporting the movement and we greatly appreciate it. All right. So uh, without further ado, you know what it is. Grab your Bible, get your mind right and prepare to think not like a Republican, not like a Democrat, but to think like a Christian. I want to start off with some scripture, if you don't mind, Christians. And it is Romans 13, verse 1, which says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Chris, I hope you know this, because if you don't know this, then I don't know why you would be part of the AND campaign. But government is God ordained to establish order. We serve a God of order. Now, what that doesn't mean is that every government is godly. Okay, so let's be clear about that. But according to folks like St. Augustine, uh, the primary purpose of government is number one, order, safety, and then some would say justice. Nothing else we enjoy, Chris, is really available If those aren't established. Okay. Now here's the tension. God also compels us to challenge unjust and immoral authority. So one say one on one sense, we are uh, to submit to governing authority. In another sense, if that authority is immoral and just, we are to challenge it. We see this in Amos. We see this in Jeremiah. We see this in Isaiah and so on. And I want you to keep that tension in mind as I talk about a battle that has been going on in the city of Atlanta, at least in city of Atlanta government, for a couple years. You see, earlier this week, the Atlanta City Council voted 11 to 4 to invest $30 million in a police training facility. The full amount of the facility, I think, is around $90 million, and the majority of that will be paid by the Atlanta Police Foundation. Now, opponents of this training facility have called the training facility cop city and just an inside thing with this is very smart because anytime that you want to go up against something you can rename it and that allows you to create a a narrative around it just some just a technique that people use all right now i'm gonna say this chris these opponents have been very very active in fact i would go so far as to say i don't know that i've seen since i've been in atlanta an initiative where the activist groups are so persistent and so energized. I got to give credit where credit is due. They are about that business. They've been on it for a minute. Uh, I think that I actually read, Chris, that they broke a record for public comment earlier this week. 350 people signed up for public comment on this one issue, and only four of them were in support of the legislation. Wow. That's serious. Public comment lasted for 14 hours. 
again, I don't think I ever saw anything like that when I was at City Hall and I saw some pretty crazy stuff. It is remarkable. The authorities had to barricade City Hall. They didn't know, you know, exactly what was going to happen. I heard some employees might have actually uh, went home early. It was serious business and they knew it was about to go down. I mean, that is is good organization. Right. Even if I don't agree with all the tactics that they used. Now, people were against this for different reasons, Chris. Uh, some would say they were against it for environmental reasons, like they were moving a lot of trees in a very forested area. Atlanta has a lot of tree cover, and I think people rightfully want to preserve that. I get it. I ain't mad at that. Um, other people thought that the money shouldn't be invested in the police, but should go to other community projects. OK, that's worth looking at. I mean, that's worth raising that question. Uh, but even prior to, to the day of the vote. Things became deadly. Right. Um, you had Manuel Taran, who was shot and killed by straight state troopers while the opponents of this uh, legislation were protesting at the proposed construction site. Now, law enforcement is saying that the protesters had set up uh, kind of like booby traps. I don't know if that's the, the technical term for it, uh, but they had set up booby traps in that area and that Taran actually shot at them first. So that's what the authorities are saying. Then. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation arrested three of the opponents on fraud charges, and they they weren't playing. They went in there heavily armed and and went in and got those folks. Some people say, was say, were saying it was too much. I'll let you be the judge. Now, some of the speakers doing public comment uh, told the city council that supporting the training center was basically sanctioning police violence against marginalized groups. They said it was militarizing the police by creating a training center. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, Chris. I, I don't I don't understand that because one of the main complaints coming out of some of the racial violence that we saw in the past few years was, was, was that officers were being were poorly trained. Was that officers were making bad decisions that were cost that was costing people their lives. Now we're saying Investing in training them is also bad. What the mayor and what the city council people who voted for this were saying was that this facility is needed for better training for existing officers and also for recruitment and retention of officers. Crime is a serious issue in the city of Atlanta, and we have people saying, no, we don't want police to have better training. Now, we can talk about the money. I do think the administration hid some of the costs early. Those costs came out late, later. I don't think that was good faith. Uh, I, I think they should have done that differently. But are we really looking at the situation that we have in this city, but in a lot of other big cities as well, and saying we don't want our police to be trained better? We don't want to make that investment? Chris, I think the root of a lot of this is the same kind of defund the police mentality. It's the abolition mentality where we say, you know, we don't really need police. We don't really need prisons. Uh, the idea that crime would somehow stop and go away if no police were there uh, and we just focused on poverty. I, I hear a lot of people because there is a connection between people being in poverty and people and, and being desperate enough you know, to commit crimes. I'm not going to deny that connection. I think there is a connection there. But the idea that if you got rid of police, you would cut down, especially on violent crime, is just ridiculous. It has no, there's no proof to show that. And even more than that, Chris, we talked about this before. I think it really shows a misunderstanding or a naivete about human nature and why people sin and why people hurt each other. Uh, mo uh, you know, I'm kind of getting sick. I don't know about you. I'm kind of getting sick of people blaming all crime on poor people. Most poor people do not commit violent crime. Most poor people are not criminals. And so before we even know who committed some, we're automatically saying blaming it on poor people. No, some people commit crimes because that's what they've chosen to do with their free will. And they're going for their interests or maybe they do have other issues going on. But we can't just simply say, hey, don't fund anything for the police. Let them go untrained or let them not be there at, at all. And things are going to just get better if you invested in other places. 
I'm all for community investment. Let's do that. Let's push them to do that. But I don't think it has to be community investment versus training the police who, if you talk to a lot of poor people who might not have been there, want the police because they know that there are people in their environments and in other environments that will take advantage or be even more violent if the police aren't around. That's the truth of it. Now, I'm going to pass it to you, Chris. The last thing I want to say, though, is I saw this tweet that said this, that basically there was no democracy in the city of Atlanta because the public commenters uh, who were against the project had way far more people than the folks that spoke against it. And I see where they're coming from. from, uh, I see where they're coming from on that. But I would push back just a little bit. Number one, we have we live in a republic not a direct democracy. So while I think it is important that they brought so many people to the public comment, while I think that should matter, and I'm glad, I mean, this was 14 hours. It was. It started at one o'clock and then ended at like 5.30 the next morning, right? So shout out to uh, the Atlanta City Council for allowing that much public comment. That is important. But we also have to understand this has been going on for two years, and these are people who have been talking to their constituents who even if they weren't there, they've had those conversations and there's a lot of other people in the city that might not have been represented by that one group that decided to come in in big numbers that one time. So just because you have more people in public comment doesn't mean you should win the conversation, especially when I think the cause really doesn't make a lot of sense. And I don't want to see Atlanta turn into what we're seeing in the uh, Pacific Northwest, where this exact framework or this exact uh, philosophy is being tested and failing miserably. But go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I, one, I, I just have to say, I'm, I'm a little glad that we're talking about uh, these kind of crazy issues in your city um, and not mine. Um, but it's, um, I think you said a, a lot of things correct. I was trying to find I felt like this was initially approved in like 2021, right? Yeah, I mean, there's been different iterations of it, but the but the actual passage for it to get funded with these numbers, I think this is the first time. This, this is the first time for that. Yeah. It, so was was this like a an electoral? Was it an issue in the elections? Because I know there was like an yeah. election in 2021, 2022. Right? Yeah, yeah, no, it's been talked about for a while, um, and it's been you know they've been trying to get it through. And this was the big vote, though. Yeah. So I, mean, I, I think on the democracy piece, which is probably the, the biggest place where I come down on this, because I think, you know, people have a right to protest. Um, but this was this was a, a, a fairly one sided vote um, supported by the mayor. Uh, it, it's coming on on the other side of an election where this was already a big part of the of the election. And one thing I have to say, you know, in Chicago, the, the folks who kind of take that more abolish the police approach did what you're supposed to do in an electoral democracy in Chicago. And they went out and won an election, right? They, they got their folks in, in the mayor's office. They got their folks in the city council Um, to say that like the, I, I believe in public comment, right? Don't get me wrong. I think we don't do enough of it in a lot of spaces, but public comment is not the best sort of evidence of democratic opinion. Um, I remember when I used to work in, in schools of education, one thing I used to always uh, say to school districts is that, you know, that six o'clock meeting, you know, on a Wednesday night is great, but a lot of parents six o'clock on a Wednesday night are doing homework, bath time, trying to get their kids in the bed, right? So that's not always going to be the very best representation of what you, what people are thinking. And I urged the school districts to do what you talked about. You got to go out and actually talk to folks. And I, I think a lot, of, I can't speak for any member of Atlanta City Council or the mayor, but I think a lot of politicians, because they are invested, at, at minimum, because they're invested in their own reelection, do try to talk to people, get some kind of sense of what's going on uh, in their communities. And, you know, so you did your public comment, you do your thing, 
when elections come around again, you can try to weigh in in that place. What I would really urge is when I was reading some of the, the coverage, and I'm, I'm not there, some of the comments from some of the folks during the public comment section, especially with the violence that preceded, when you stand up there and say, well, we're not going to let this go, and this thing is never going to be built no matter what, blah, blah, blah. Like, we don't live in a system that says that you can do whatever you want to do to stop uh you know, you, t- yeah. a, a, this thing from happening. You can protest, you can do your thing, but you can't be out there setting booby traps, having, you know, kind of violent opposition to something that has been approved by democratically elected officials. And this is the thing. Though. I'm glad you brought that up because I meant to say something about that. So it, when this, what, what uh, Chris is talking about, after this was passed, not only were these folks cussing out the uh, and threatening the council people, they were saying this will never be built. Now, they could just mean that we're going to keep fighting and we're going to persuade you to (laughs) pull back this legislation. Or they could have meant that they're going to really stand in the way of this. And to some extent, they still have the right to do some of that as, you know, civil disobedience. But at a certain point, somebody's already gotten killed over this. Be very careful what you use and what you think you're going to do to to stop this from moving forward. And, you know, you always have the issue of how many people are actually from here and all those other things that go into what people are actually doing with the public comment. Now, I want to be very clear before we get out of here. Public comment is important. Yes, it can change. It can rightfully change someone's mind if you make a logical case and you, you know, and you do it very clearly. Right. It's real. Mm -hmm. But. To say that d- democracy wasn't served or there is a miscarriage of democracy because you had the most people and they didn't change their minds. Eleven council people said no. Yeah. And I would imagine if it was closer that some of those other ones that said yes might have said, I mean, I'm saying eleven council people said yes. I'm not sure that some of those other council people weren't let off the hook and and, and went against it. But if it was closer, might have actually said yes, too. Yeah. So you never know. That's a that's a big spread. Valiant effort. You win some, you lose some. Um, and yeah, so, it, you know, we'll see what happens. But it certainly wasn't necessarily undemocratic. Anything else, Chris? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's the that's the big takeaway for me is that, you know, I, I believe in protest, definitely believe in, in public comment. Uh, but some of that commentary was a little... It caused a question to me, especially against the backdrop of some a man already losing his life uh, right. in, in this thing. All right. As many of you know, when we talked about last week, it is Pride Month. Uh, And while many of us don't celebrate Pride Month or many of us think it does include things that we see to be sin and shouldn't be celebrated. uh, I know, at least for me, I do acknowledge that community. And I do think that Christians should approach the conversation as neighbors, um, as peacemakers and as truth tellers. And so I think we should keep that in mind, even if it's something that we don't uh, really get involved in. Well, Dr. Russell Moore, who is now the editor of Christianity Today, and I actually had a chance to be on his podcast uh, yesterday. I think it's coming out later this week or maybe early next week. But he wrote an article in uh, in that publication entitled Don't Pretend the Ugandan Homosexuality Law is Christian. The tagline was not everything that's a sin is a crime, let alone one punishable by death. He starts by talking about how uh, Senator Ted Cruz was attacked from the right. Yes, Senator Ted Cruz attacked from the right uh, for saying that Uganda shouldn't criminalize homosexuality and execute gay people on Twitter. He says this, at issue is a harsh new law signed by Uganda's president that would not only outlaw homosexuality, but also mandate conversion therapy type rehabilitation for gay people who are arrested and require a kind of surveillance culture in which citizens are criminally liable for not turning in people they know to be gay. But most chilling of all, the law would impose the death penalty on categories deemed to be aggravated homosexuality. Uh, Moore basically says after that that he believes homosexuality is a sin uh, because he is an Orthodox Christian. And he believes and because he believes in the authority of Scripture. And for that same reason, he sees this law as wrong. It was interesting to me, Chris, that 
so many folks on social media had a problem and y'all forced me to agree with Ted Cruz is, is rough, <laughs> but, but so many folks on social media had a problem with Ted Cruz saying that this law was bad. Um, I don't, I'm not sure I, I get that. You know, some people, you know, pop up and they say, well, the, you know, the Bible in Leviticus says this when we're talking about a certain point in redemptive history. Right. Um, and we're talking about what what God is saying to his people. Um, but the Bible also says a lot of sexual acts are bad. The Bible says a lot of things that we do are wrong. Are we OK with that same result for us? Because I can tell you in my past, if, if 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 that was maintained, then I wouldn't be here right now. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and so we don't only think things are right or wrong because of what ha- could have happened to us, but sometimes it helps us understand and not be so um, hypocritical. Uh, we can stand on the historic Christian sexual ethic and say that a law like this just has no place. Uh, it's a human rights violation. It's not OK. Uh, and I don't think we should stand there and say, well, because we're in this tough battle and we feel threatened that we can act like this is something that should be supported. Now I'll I'll be straight up. And this is one, this is a one African country, right? It's not all of Africa. That's that, you know, that's going along with this, but I I think in, on many issues, the African church in, 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 in certain, certain denominations, the way that it stood up against the West on some of these issues have been right. In this particular instance, I think they've gone way too far and that, and it's not okay. Right. So I can't just choose a side because I see what's wrong with the West and see what's wrong with the mainline church that's basically going along with anything secular progressivism wants them to do. And I don't know. I can't name the last time that they stood up and told the left that it's going too far. But I can't just because I see that issue and that error take the side of anybody that's against what they say. This this is this is just plainly wrong. Chris, anything uh, anything to add to that? Man, one, I will say that uh, I I would urge people to go read the article from uh, from Dr. Marvin. It just it, it almost reads like a sermon. I was I wanted to say, yeah, uh, "Amen" a few times when I was reading it, and especially during this month when a lot of us are going to be interacting with people around this conversation, both inside and outside of the church. I thought it was just a very uh, well written article. If you want to be uh, equipped with some language and some thinking and some orientation to engage around this uh, issue. Um, I would urge reading for that purpose. Um, there are probably not too many people listening to this podcast. I have to believe in my heart, Justin, that would actually argue that it is good and right, um, you know, to arrest, to surveil, um, and on occasion to execute people uh, for living a homosexual lifestyle. Um, you, you don't have to affirm that ethic in order to understand uh, clearly that, uh, that this type of activity is wrong and, and you know, the, and that there is some incumbent, um, th- there's some responsibility incumbent on the Christian to say something about that. Um, and, and again, like I understand folks, uh, even folks in the United States who may not feel like there need to be like these proactive protections for LGBTQ communities um, who may feel like existing laws uh, already protect uh, those communities um, in a sufficient way. That's a the discussion argument that can be had. I understand that some people might, you know, just maybe don't feel like they want to comment, might not even be aware of like the laws that are happening in Uganda. But uh, it, it goes to the point that at any moment where we say that somebody's basic uh, sort of civil liberties, it's okay to violate them because of their sexual orientation, that is just not backed up by the scripture. And if you're talking about a proactive violation, right? Like, I don't think there's a, we're not responsible to, necessarily advocate for these proactive protections if we're convinced that existing law already protects people but if there is proactive law that proactively and aggressively is like harming people 
as, if, if it were happening, like if this were in, the, in a United States context or in any local community, I would say not only is Dr. Moore right and Ted Cruz, you know, you're going to hear this on the Church Politics Podcast right now, Ted Cruz is right. Um, but I would say that there'd be a problem if the church weren't saying something about it, right? Um, so we, we just have to get this. I would say one other thing, I, I hope that it also at some point writing like, uh, like what you have in Christianity today right now, um, this conversation that we, were ha- that we are having right now, hopefully it begins to reach also on the left um, so that people can understand that just because I'm not affirming of that of homosexual lifestyle, I don't, you know, we're not going to do a, a wedding uh, in my church. That does not equate to being an advocate to, you know, uh, violate civil liberties to arrest, to surveil, to execute, that type of thing. So it, it sort of cuts both ways. I thought it was a very important article. I urge people to go uh, and check it out. Yeah. And just realize, man, this isn't a words or violence situation. This is violence. Yeah, This is state sanctioned violence. Um, and that's not OK, man. So we want to make sure that we're never silent about things like that. Uh, we may have our disagreements, but we love our LGBTQ neighbors uh, and, and hope for their flourishing. And this does not fit uh, what we see uh, Jesus doing. I mean, the adulterous woman or anything else, this is not does not fit that model. So we want to be very clear about that. Um, we, we, we talk about how we need to listen to people who we may not agree with on certain things. Right. And I found that um, Jonathan Haidt, who is a, a atheist is someone who obviously I have some serious disagreements when it comes to theological issues, mm-hmm. but someone that, is very intellectually honest and makes some good points. Uh, and I think it shows us why there is common grace and why Christians do not have a monopoly on all good ideas or, or all that's right. Um, and so I really do enjoy talking about his articles. He has an article, a new article in um, the Atlantic uh, magazine, basically saying that all schools should be phone free, right? Uh, He says this, he says, more American schools, arguably all schools, should make themselves into genuinely phone free zones. Uh, How would you uh, uh, how would that look in practice? I think it's helpful, he says, to look uh, to think of phone restrictions on a scale from one to five as follows. So, Chris, he says level one on, you know, taking restricting phone use, he says, uh, would be that students can take their phone out during class, but only to use it for class purposes. Level two is this. He says students can hold on to their phone, but are not supposed to take it out of their pocket or their backpack at all during class times. Now, some tells me those first two sound good, <laughs> right? But if they're accessible, it might not be so easy. Um, level three, he said phone phone caddies in classrooms. Students put their phone into a wall pocket or storage unit unit at the start of each class and then pick it up at the end of the class. Uh, and so he was, he was saying that these three levels seem to be ones most commonly employed by schools today. So those are the top three of, of folks who restrict phone use at all. And one thing I was interested in, in hearing during, during, you know, in reading during this article was I always wondered why kids need phones in school at all and why don't they just automatically restrict it but he explains that a lot of parents are saying that they need to talk to their kids access to their kids during school yeah the parents are standing in the way of them actually learning and i I don't think we even have to explain the article explains it hopefully we don't even have to explain why this might be a distraction (laughs) and why this might add to people phone addiction and add to you know and add to even some of the uh, psychological, you know, psychological issues that we're seeing with a lot of young people. So those were the first three levels. That's what most, you know, most schools are doing that are doing anything. Here are the here are the next two levels, the final two levels. Lockable pouches. Students are required to put their phone into their own personal pouch when they arrive at school, which is then locked with a magnetic pin. All right. Students keep the pouch with them, but cannot unlock it until the end of the school day when they are given access to a magnetic unlocking device. And number five, phone lockers. 
students lock their phone into a secure unit with a, with many small compartments when they arrive at school. They keep uh, they keep their key and get access to the phone lockers again only when they leave school. He ends by saying this: "All children de deserve schools that will help them learn, cultivate." deep friendships and develop into mentally healthy young adults all children deserve phone free schools i'm with them i i'm, I'm with level five level four whatever we got to do i'm 100 percent with that there's no i mean what happened to just call if you really need to get in touch with your kid and there's an emergency call the school what good i mean what good is it doing for you to be talking to your kid after each class or whatever, like it, it just doesn't make any sense. But Chris, uh, what are your thoughts? I know you're deeper into the education game. Yeah, I mean, yes and no. I mean, I I, I think that um, one, you know, I, I think I'm one. I'm, I'm a big believer in letting schools, you know, kind of operate at the school level as much as possible. Uh, but on a on an idea basis. I try to be like super reserved because I know at some level, like we're like old men here. Um, okay. But I was talking to some of the, some of the kids around here at the church super recently, uh, just about like, and I think just like millennials, we're, we're the last generation who actually had the experience of like waiting for your parent, right? Like, so your parent gets off of work, you're off of school. And there's this window of time where like, you're waiting for them. Like they're somewhere in the world, but you don't know exactly where. And you just kind of watch cartoons until, you know, until they get there or pick you up from grandma's house or whatever it is. But this, this, we, you always are able to reach your parent now because like, your parent has a cell phone. Uh, but I was just trying to remind her, like there was a time when you didn't have a cell phone and, you know, you just kind of, hung on like I, I i remember 9 11 i was at school on september 11th and you know a lot of folks were like calling the schools very few kids had cell phones uh at the time and a, a major thing like that you know we made it through so i i think that it would be helpful for students i am very concerned about what the what the phones are doing. I have a daughter who is turning 12 this year um, and wanting to get a phone. And so my family is working through that. Uh, I think if schools were better partners, I will say this with parents um, and, and parents better partners with schools uh, on the idea of, of, of kind of creating some kind of safe zone in life. Uh, and I think school would be an ideal place. I, and I, I'll, I'll finish with this. There are a lot of places right now um, yeah, like if you if you work at FedEx, you can't bring or like Amazon, you can't bring your phone into the building, right? Like it's a locker outside the building, you cannot bring your phone into the building. Um, and so people do this and don't die right now. Um, so something to to consider. That's good. So what I'm hearing from you is number one, it should be a local issue. It shouldn't be like national legislation. I agree with you there. It's, it's a local decision. Um, are you saying that you disagree with height? I, I, are, you, are you saying that, do you agree that the phone should, there shouldn't be phone access? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, I, I, I just, I try to be sensitive because I understand that I am not like growing up in this world right now, but I can't figure out in my mind why you need a phone in your hand all day at school. And I don't see how it's making you more safe. Like maybe you feel the parent might feel like they're making their kid more safe. I don't think that it is, so. especially when you in anything that happens like this, even if we say there's competing goods, I don't see the other good. But if there, even if we were to say these are competing goods, if you balance it, the long term benefits of not being distracted while you're at school and not being addicted to being on social, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. the long term benefits, learning how to be without your phone and not look at it for six hours, I think far outweigh any yeah. potential benefit that people might see that you get from this. I don't know. I mean, I, I am a dinosaur, so I, I will admit that. Yeah. So I, I'd, I'd lose the phones. That's, that's my view. <laughs> Let's lose the phones. We'll do it locally. 
the kids, I believe you will, will soon learn that they can survive without their phones. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for joining us as always. And camp, there is a cross that neither political conservatism nor progressivism is fit to bear. There's a civic hearing in need of faithful witnesses that love social justice and won't surrender the truth to be loved by the world. Politic with the boldness and compassion of Jesus Christ. Until next time, Ann Kemp. Well, how at you.